multum non multa. A Latin proverb that comes from classical pedagogy. Christopher Perrin is an author that I came across on my search for understanding this concept better. He specializes in classical education. In one of his lectures, he discusses this concept in terms of knowledge. Today, I want to challenge you to apply this in terms of life. But before we do that, let's unravel the notion. This phrase, multum non multa, comes from Pliny the Younger, who was an author from ancient Rome, who wrote about this in a letter dating back nearly 2,000 years. So why am I recalling history when we are meant to be discussing the future? Literally translated, multum non multa means much, not many. A more contemporary use of this as a proverb would be quality over quantity. You've probably heard this and never thought to apply it to life itself until now. So how can an ancient Latin proverb written about thousands of years ago pave the path for a shift in the way current and future generations contemplate life? Well, spoiler alert, Pliny the Younger was actually onto something pretty revolutionary. When he first wrote about this, his presumed intention was to convey knowledge as something to be achieved in breadth rather than depth. So, in summary, knowing something and mastering it very well was of greater value than knowing many things adequately. Think about this in terms of your life just now. I want you to picture something you feel as though you've mastered, whether it's playing an instrument or speaking a foreign language. What is of greater value? Being able to play multiple instruments adequately or being able to play a symphony that could bring Mozart himself to tears? And in mastery, do you concern yourself with the instruments that you could have played adequately or do you just enjoy the quality of sound that you are able to produce? Pliny the Younger was right to say that to accomplish breadth is achieved through depth. When you love something, when you truly, truly give it your all, inadvertently you are taking all that there is to take from that single thing. So you have become the master of the many that matters most to you. What is the point of all of this? Now that you have a fundamental understanding to quality over quantity, I want to share with you how I came to apply this deceptively simple proverb to my life and to my death. From a very, yep, that's me. <laughs> From a very young age, I had mapped out my whole life. I mean it literally, my whole life. From the early age of three, maybe with a little help from my parents, up until the ripe old age of 100. Precisely 100. I remember this so clearly. When I was five, I turned to my mother and I said, promise me that when we reach 100 and we move on to whatever is next, that we will find each other. You could imagine that morbid little five-year-old me wasn't invited to many sleepovers. And this is something that I kept reminding her of throughout my whole life. 100 was my closure milestone. I could only get through the day knowing that death awaits us all by holding on to this misconstrued idea that we all live to be 100, and only then will we have managed to accomplish all that we set out to. I found comfort in chronological age. So, when I was meant to attend compulsory education, I did. I enrolled for an additional two years of post-secondary. I intended to go to university and maybe get married along the way and have my first dance to Unshaded Melody by the Righteous Brothers. And if you don't know that song, thank you, someone knows it. It's the song from Ghost, you know, when they're doing the pottery scene. So that's a tangent. Anyway, I wanted to have at least three kids and work towards becoming a tenured lecturer, eventually retire to take care of my family. And as I would reach my 100th birthday, I would pass on by natural causes. I swear, all of this was planned as soon as I could speak. I was the girl with the plan, and my whole life became about achievement in breadth. I was so focused on what I needed to do to achieve the next step, that I became riddled with anxiety any time there was a change in my routine. During my first year at post-secondary, I came to know about Huntington's after learning that it was a gene present in my family. So my brother and I were given the option of getting tested and one blood test down the line and a couple of months later, our results were ready. It was the 21st of October, 2014. Our appointment was at noon and at 22, I rolled out of bed. I hadn't lost a single wink of sleep over it. It was a day just like any other because these things happened to five to seven people out of a possible 100,000. 
literally, those are the presumed statistics for Huntington's. So, on an island of approximately 400,000 people, that meant at most only 28 could be so unlucky. When I first saw my results, I was blind to the words that said Samantha's predicted to develop Huntington's. I was just so focused on the difference between my results compared to my brother's. From that very moment, I had already gained so much perspective on what truly matters in life. When I saw my results, I knew that my family meant the world to me because I didn't feel sad. I felt relief that it was me and not him. Then I was numb because even though my whole life was summarized on that piece of paper, you see, I couldn't read between the lines. My mother and brother could, and they weeped. They mourned the life I had intended to live, the person that I was and no longer would be. The doctor turned to me and she said, Sam, there's nothing you can do about it. At 17, you feel infinite, or at least I did. I felt like I could do anything and nothing could touch me. And suddenly, my own DNA had betrayed me, and there was nothing that I could do about it because it is totally and utterly incurable. The one thing I knew for sure was that I was guaranteed a horrific decline in functioning to a point where my own body would hold me prisoner. That night, I researched all that I could about Huntington's, but the outcome was the same. As I watched people recount stories of their loved ones once full of life, now reduced to a slow, agonizing suffering, I realized that it wasn't death that I was staring at. The one enemy I was so sure of wasn't the enemy at all. It was time that had betrayed these people. And so began my agenda against time. I cried myself to sleep because I felt helpless against time. I could live a life shorter than others, but full of so much life, yet I still had to wait for the pain and the suffering that would come. I had to accept the fact that I might lose all of my memories. But what I couldn't understand was why time was the enemy when time is man-made. I mean, who proposed that we could only find closure in death when it means dying at an old age? And I'm sure some of you have witnessed this. We admire the elderly who have found peace with death. In fact, when they haven't resigned to it and they are still in deep denial with themselves, we do what we can to help them get there. But why do we wait so long? We know we're destined to die from the moment we take our first breath, yet we fear it so tremendously. A part of the problem comes from this deceiving idea that we are meant to follow a designated sequence to life and that we only die when we're old. You and I both know that sadly that's not the case. It was predestined for me to live a life shorter than others. It wasn't chance. So how do I find closure in death? when time is my enemy, and the world that I live in values life in terms of years. Euthanasia. Well, more precisely, assisted dying. One day, on our way back from meeting someone with Huntington's, my mother turned to me and she said, Sam, you know, I realized your life will be about the quality you live and not the quantity of years you have. You will live so much more in your short amount of time than most people do in their whole uninterrupted lifespan. And I thought to myself, why do we celebrate years over accomplishments? Why is life measurable by time as opposed to truly having lived? I knew I was the master of my own fate. I want to go out with a bang when I can still laugh and cry and hug my loved ones when I'm still me, as opposed to an embodiment of a genetic mutation. That's when I came across Dignitas. It's an organization in Switzerland that offers assisted dying to people in unendurable pain and suffering. I began reading all that I could about it, but what really resonated throughout their story was that they valued dignity in life and death. Two months just before I was diagnosed, there was a man called Bob who traveled to Dignitas to terminate his life. He spent his time campaigning for dignity and dying upon learning that he had terminal lung cancer. But what made Bob such a special case was that 18 months prior, he had already been to Dignitas, but not for him, for his wife, Annie. You see, Annie had Parkinson's, and she deteriorated pretty quickly, but not before deciding to define her life by quality over quantity. I think what struck me the most was the fact that Bob watched his wife smile at him 
and press the clicker for the lethal dose that would take his wife away forever. Yet he didn't fear it. He valued the time he got to spend with her. And when it came down to being a decision he would also have to make, he had no regrets over what Annie did. He knowingly put himself in the same situation. In fact, he said, you go into hospital and you see beds full of people just waiting to die. I climbed mountains, I ate good food, and I worked hard. I don't want to die painfully and slowly watching TV and eating chocolate ice cream. There is absolutely no quality of life to that. We have used time to find closure, and now we are in a dysfunctional relationship with it. Time doesn't guarantee life. Living is an act of choice. And when we outlive life itself, that's when we should be worried. We should be more concerned with occupying space and time idly waiting for death to take us than living to our utmost and choosing to go before that ability is robbed from us. To fall back on the metaphor we used earlier, I would rather call it a day when I can still play the most beautiful symphonies than stick around and squeeze out subpar melodies. So what is the way forward? Just as we have the right to our own life, we should be entrusted with the right to our own death. The main opposing argument I've come across when campaigning for euthanasia is that it's a slippery slope. Let me clarify, this is not the case. Research has found that vulnerable groups like the poor or the elderly are actually less likely to take advantage of assisted dying. Thanks to safe, strict laws, it has been successfully implemented in over eight countries. As for leaving death in the hands of God, let me paint you an objective picture. Imagine that you are in a poker game. God is a dealer, and the hand of cards that you've been dealt are horrible. You are guaranteed to lose, and losing isn't pleasant, it's rather agonizing. However, instead of being able to fold because it is your hand to play, you are forced to sit at the table and play on with the same unchangeable hand of cards, game after game, every round losing a little bit more until there's nothing, nothing left to lose. You could have folded, taken your winnings and called it a day when you were still in the game, but you are trapped instead because the ability to leave, despite guaranteed and variable suffering, was robbed from you. Does that seem like a fair game to you? We have become so obsessed with prolonging life that we have found resolve in becoming a shell of a person as a cost of it. But where does it end? Do we exhaust our loved ones because letting go is hard? It is meant to be hard. It means there is something worth having. People ask me, Sam, wouldn't you rather live as many years as you can? What if you change your mind? After tonight, I hope that you can answer this for me. I have chosen to live my life in depth, appreciating every single moment as it comes. I have chosen to master the art of life. And in return, that's all the breadth I will ever need. This is the way it has been intended since the dawn of time. Plenty of the younger knew it, but somehow we've lost it along the way of innovation and life-sustaining measures. I am so wrapped up in the life that I live that I don't concern myself with the years I won't get. When my scale begins to tip to quantity at the cost of quality, then I will greet death like an old welcome friend because I am not afraid anymore. How can you be afraid when your life was never measured by the, the years that weren't guaranteed, rather, but by the peace of mind that you managed to do the one thing you set out to do, you managed to truly live. So I will leave you with this final question for tonight. Will you measure your life by multum or by multa? Thank you.